Good morning, Bridge. Come on, let's stand together and worship our God. All right, let's sing some O's together. Oh! 
Well, let's stand together as we worship Jesus. Jesus, who he is in this series uh, that we are doing right now called Regarding Jesus. Uh, we're going to sing a few hymns together here about Jesus, and um, these are hymns that uh, we grew up with. Uh, now, this first hymn here, we're going to do it in a little different style than, uh, than maybe we, we grew up with, uh, but uh, you're probably familiar, uh, many of you are probably familiar with uh, this hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and uh, uh, the uh, this song here has added a little chorus in there. And so I want to teach you this chorus here together so that we can sing this together. It just goes, Oh, what a friend. And oh, what a friend in Jesus. Oh, what a friend. So let's sing that again. And oh, what a friend. Oh, what a friend in Jesus. Oh, what a friend. Oh, what a friend 
in Jesus. All right, let's try singing this, this uh, hymn together. What a friend we have in Jesus. And what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. And what a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. And oh, what peace. And oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. chorus together. Oh, what a friend. Oh, what a friend. Oh, what a friend in Jesus. Oh, what a friend. And oh, what a friend in Jesus. And have we trials and their trouble anywhere. Jesus, Savior, is our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with the load of care? Jesus knows our every Sing it again. Oh, what a friend. Jesus. 
Precious Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. God, we thank you that you are trustworthy and we can put our full weight upon you, God. Thank you for you are, that you are a friend that sticks closer to a brother. And so, God, we, uh, we trust you this morning. May we learn more of you and open our eyes and ears to what you would teach us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. A few years ago, I worked at a camp. I was probably 16. And because a lot of us were, were young guys, and it's not a good idea to throw like five to seven young guys in a cabin without supervision, because when guys get together, usually their IQ point drops by 20 every time you add another guy. And so they thought, hey, maybe a good thing to do would be to put you know, someone from our program staff in uh, the maintenance cabin, because that's what we did. And we, we made, a, would say, a fun summer out of cutting grass, riding gravelies, uh, you know, weed whacking, doing all those kinds of things. But then when we got to our downtime, uh, that's when the stupid would come out. We'd work hard all day and then have stupid evenings together. And so the guy they put in with us, great guy, but the problem was he's on a program team. So he had to leave for a little bit and, and leave us to ourselves, sometimes into the, into the night when things got dark. And there were just dumb things we did. We had a chair that would spin and we would put it in the center of the room and we drew fluorescent arrows on the ceiling fan, and we would spin the guy in the chair staring at the ceiling fan the opposite way that the fan was spinning. So as you can imagine, it, it had a, an effect on you. And so the, the goal was to stop the chair at the door so the guy could run out, step off this you know, two-foot drop off the porch, get to the center of the field and touch the rock. Now, it just sounds stupid, but we had so much fun doing it because our IQ points were lowered. And we watched guys vomit on the rock, and we'd bring them a bucket of water and a sponge to clean up the rock. We, we just did a lot of stupid things like that. So fast forward a few years later, 2015, I'm an adult, I'm married, I have children, and I'm the chapel speaker. They hear I was a former maintenance guy, and they invite me down to their cabin. And I just thought, oh, they just want to hear stories and hang out. I'll sit in for devotion. Well, they, they heard that story earlier in the week, and they got what was left of one of those merry-go-rounds, just the, the center part, and they would put guys on it and spin it as fast as they could. So naturally, they asked me to do it, and you know my IQ points dropped because I left my wife and kids. And so I was involved with that. And then... My old boss, the camp manager, my best friend's dad, comes down and starts, you know, he's mad because we're making all this noise. It, it was like I was 16 again, getting yelled at by my best friend's dad. And he didn't even realize I was there. But there we were, carrying on. And, and, and so that's, that's what guys do. And it can, it can lead you to ask the question, who's in charge right now? What is going on? Why, why did we lose control. And, and here's the fact of the matter. Some of the guys went too far when I was growing up. They got fired from the camp and they weren't asked to come back the next summer because they forgot that someone else was in charge. Someone else was in charge of them. See, sometimes when we're goofing off and doing those things, we're not really in charge. We just forgot that somebody else was. And that is so true when you think about the Christian life. If, if you're a person who follows Jesus and says, he is my Lord, he is my Savior, there are moments, I think, when you're living life that you forget, hey, he's the one who's in charge. He's the one I should be living for. He's the one I should be following. He's the one I should submit to. I say that because we're in part six of our series regarding Jesus, as you may have heard already today. And if you're reading along with us, this section dealt with the dominion and the authority of Jesus. And if you read this week, you would have read about a Jesus who had authority over the weather. And there was a time when he calmed the storm. It's in the Gospels. The disciples were scared because he was asleep. And he woke up and he said, peace be still. And they were like, who is this guy? The weather listens to him. I'm not talking about like Gloria Copeland and some of the other health wealth people think that they can control the weather and she said that they caused a tornado to go back up into a sky, which is just ridiculous. Jesus had real dominion over the weather. We also read an account in the book of Mark where Jesus demonstrated his authority over the spiritual realm, where there were demon-possessed guy, a guy came and had a legion of demons in him and he, he cast out the demons. 
showing he had authority over angels and demons and all that was made in the spiritual realm. And then the last two sections dealt with Jesus' authority over life and death. And for some of us, this is really important to keep in mind. His authority over death, and he demonstrated his power on a couple occasions when he rose uh, individuals from the dead, including Lazarus in John chapter 11. And then he had power over his own death when he rose from the grave, but he has power over your death and my death as well. He knows when that's going to happen. We don't. It says in the Bible, what, what can you add to your life? Can you even add a day or an hour by worrying or by all these things? No. Jesus knows when you were born in your appointed time to die. So the question we got to wrestle with this morning, if Jesus has that kind of dominion, he has that kind of authority, what should our response be to him? What should our disposition be to him? And I say the only acceptable response to the authority and dominion of Jesus is worship. And there's a beautiful text we're going to look at this morning. It's just two verses, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Paul's going to give us the very appropriate response of those that call themselves Christ followers. See, we can't act like knuckleheads and live like knuckleheads like we did when I was working at camp. We can't just, you know, think, oh, I got this. I can do my own thing. I've been charged for now. I know what's best. How many of you would let a child, you know, 10 years old say, hey, here's my car keys. You can bring it around. I trust you. You know it's best. You know how to do this. No, we wouldn't do that. But when you think about the gap between God's wisdom and ours, that, that's, that doesn't even give us a picture to even think about how much wiser and more holy and righteous and just that he is than us. So before we read our main text, I want you to keep in mind that this passage also comes with the context, and we don't have time to, to, to get into all of that, but Paul uh, just finished an exhortation in defense of the gospel that began in chapter 1, verse 18, and went all the way to ver- chapter 11, verse 36. And, and so this is kind of the, the, the lynch point, the change, where, where Paul's going to say, look, this is how you respond to this good gospel. And for our purposes this morning, we respond to our king in this way, because our king owns that gospel. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may be discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect." So two short verses sum up, I believe, what our entire response and disposition should be to Jesus. Now, keep in mind, because we are human and we're battling the sinful nature while we're here, this is going to be something that takes a lifetime to get good at. So let's take this a point at a time. You got your fill in the blanks in front of you, and here's the first one. Paul first appeals to the mercies of God. Paul first appear, appeals to the mercies of God. If you look back with me at verse 1, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Think about that. He's talking about the God who has authority over the elements. He's just saying, uh, talking about the God who has authority over angels and demons, the God who has authority over death, and the God who has authority over your death and eternal destiny eternal residence. He starts by appealing to the mercies of that great God. Listen to Ephesians verses 2, 8, and 9. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. You didn't earn it so that no one may boast or brag about what has happened to you spiritually. So when we think about the goodness of the gospel, we think about the grace, the riches of God, along with that came mercy, meaning there was a punishment that you and I deserve. We deserve because we have sinned. We have rebelled against God. And in God's goodness to us, he withheld the punishment. That's his mercy, protecting us from what we deserved. A lot of times we say, I deserve more than that. It's like, well, more, more what? Let's, let's clear that up. You deserve more punishment than you've gotten because Jesus took that from you at the cross. But the grace is the riches and the adoption and all the things we find in Ephesians that say, hey, we belong to God and we receive adoptions and inheritance, a future and a hope because of the gospel. 
Now look at that word, therefore. You've heard this said by many Bible teachers. You always ask the question, what is that therefore, therefore? Well, it connects you to what's previously been said. And I want to just read verses 33 through 36 of Romans chapter 11 so you can understand what led Paul to this pivot point. It ties us back to where he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Have you ever paused and realized how much you don't know and how much he does know? And we often do that with humans. We put people on a pedestal where we think, well, that guy's really smart. Uh, listen to Paul. He's not saying that about a human. He's saying, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Some of you have heard you know, the paraphrase of that when you're struggling with your wives. Who has known the mind of your wife? who has been her counselor. That's kind of a cheap shot that guys like to give their wives when they don't understand what's going on with her. But, but this is really the origin of that cheap shot quote. It's asking the question in a serious way, who has been, known the mind of the Lord? Who has ever tried to counsel him? In fact, you see one guy in the book of Job start to ask questions and God shows up and says, who are you to question me? Who are you Surely, who made the universe? You know, you know the dimensions. And he speaks very sarcastically with Job because Job is trying to get an answer from God. Verse 35, he says, or who has given a gift to him that it might be repaid? Do you realize God needs nothing from you? God needs nothing from me. That's an amazing thing that we get to come and worship. And what we're doing here doesn't add anything to him. It doesn't change anything about his vastness, his greatness, but he loves us, and he loves it when we give him glory and honor. Verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So he ends that section and then starts chapter 12. Therefore, in view of God's mercy. Now, the first thing we need to know, uh, looking at verse 1, and, and I hope this is clear to you as it is to, to me and, and others, that the first thing we, we know is that Paul is talking specifically to Christians, to those that believe Jesus. Do you know that this morning? And if you're here and you're reading this, and you're like, man, I hope this applies to me, it only applies to you if you've said, yes, I'm following Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Paul says these words, he says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So as Paul's writing verse 1, he has believers in mind because the unsaved, they're not following, and they're also wouldn't be able to understand him. So we get to that word appeal, and in in, in some translations it uses the word urge, and what Paul is doing is he's asking them, you know, with earnest, earnestness and, and propriety and saying, hey, look, I, I'm putting this request or this plea on you in view of God's mercy. That's, that's why I'm ap- appealing to you. Now, the word appeal, as I said, is sometimes translated urge. Uh, it, it sounds like just, just a really good suggestion or a pleading, but it, it, in one sense, it's a command because it carries the full weight of Paul's apostolic authority. So as he's saying, hey, I appeal to you, I urge you, I I want you to think about, because of God's mercy, these things you're supposed to do, he's speaking with tenderness, humility, but also with authority. See, the implication here is that those people that have experienced that mercy and grace should be pushed to follow and to do these things he's going to suggest next. So he says, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. Think about that phrase. Salvation, sonship, and inheritance. Punishment diverted to Jesus instead of to us. Knowing our penalty for sin was kept from us. Those are the things Paul starts out by saying, look, stop and think about this. Because of this, I'm urging you to do this next thing. Now the question you need to wrestle with this morning is, do you claim to be a Christ follower? Think about your life just for a moment. Is your life being lived in a way that demonstrates gratitude to God for his mercy to you? When you read a command in the Bible, do you read it and say, this God who showed me mercy gave it to me, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it with all my heart. I'm going to do it with joy. I might not like it. I might have other things I wish I could do instead, 
But do you recognize that those words that are in that book are there, placed there by the one who gave you mercy? And if you're not a follower of Jesus, may this be the morning where you confess your sin, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus, and start to live for him from here on out. So when we say this is, this is written to Christians, it's not those that just prayed a prayer one time and then life was no different after that. We have a culture full of those. See, I was listening to a pastor last night, and it was like hand-wringing against the culture, hand-wringing against everything that happened. Now, there are things you should be alarmed about for sure, but, but where have the Christians been for the past 30, 40 years? It got that way because we left our post. So we're not talking about those that just pray to prayer and claim Christ. We're talking about those who are actively, lovingly following him and recognize the mercy he gave us. Second thing we get from Paul and the second part of verse one is that the only appropriate response to Jesus is to give your whole self to him, is to hold nothing back. He writes, I urge you in view of God's mercies to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That, that's huge. That's, that's not like, hey, I'll do it if I have time, or I'll do it if it feels good, or hey, I'll try it. If I like it, I'll keep doing it. He says, no, you're, to present your bodies as a living, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And then he tags on, this is your spiritual worship. See, Christ followers, if you follow the train of thought here, your soul belongs to God. Those are the people he's appealing to. And the next step is, hey, your soul belongs to God. Now your body needs to belong to him also. In 2 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul writes these words. He says, or do you not know that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Your body does not belong to you. A lot of times I hear people say, especially young people, it's not hurting anyone but me. It's, oh, why is it a problem if I'm not hurting other people? Well, it's my body. I can do what I want with it. Well, no, if you're a Christian, it says you were bought with a price. You do not belong to you. You belong to him, and your body is a place on earth for the temple of the Holy Spirit to dwell. Now, we get to this word present. He says to present your bodies. Uh, this is the literal act of placing an offering on the altar. You are presenting your body on the altar to God. See, when you think about Jesus bringing us new life and salvation, uh, you're saved. Your inner self and your soul already is with him, has been revived by him. It belongs to him. But God wants the shell that you dwell in on this earth as well. We are called to act out what scholars, some scholars refer to as a priestly act of worship. See, this is why I get so like frustrated when, when, you know, whether it's my kids or young Christians or youth group kids over the years go, what's the big deal? I did this thing. It's not that big a deal. It's like, well, wait a minute. You think about all that Jesus did for you, all that Jesus separated you from as far as your sin and, and, and all the wrath that's in eternity and all the goodness he gave you. And he's calling you to be this living sacrifice. Even little things can sometimes be a big deal if you're taking God lightly. Now, think about this word present for a second. It's already been used back in chapter 6. There was a couple verses where Paul was urging the audience not to present their bodies to acts of sin, but instead of that, present the parts of their body to acts of righteousness. So, so there's a switch that's supposed to happen if you're a Christian. You, you, you change from just living the way you want to live, recognizing God saved you, and that your body needs to be offered to God as this spiritual act of worship, and, and all of a sudden you start to use your mind, your, your hands, your feet for good things instead of for sin. That's part of worshiping God. See, see, here's the thing. I want to make this clear. This is not legalism. Legalism is a bunch of extra rules that Christians put on others and say, do this or you're not really a Christian. And what they're really meant to be is guardrails to keep yourself in line and you take your guardrails and put them on other people. Uh, this idea of saying, no, I'm going to use my, my members of my body, I'm going to use my mind to glorify God, to serve him. It's what we're called to do as believers. This is not the extra stuff that gets interpreted as legalism. You are called to be changed. See, a believer's offering of his total life as a sacrifice to God is there for sacred service. It's a quote from John MacArthur. 
Have you here at Bridge Bible Church put yourself on that proverbial altar to God as a sacrifice to the one true God? John MacArthur says this, the only spiritual, spiritual service of worship that honors and pleases God is the sincere, loving, thoughtful, and heartfelt devotion and praise of his children. Think about that for a moment. If you're a parent, this might resonate with you. You get a kid who's just always making a mess, always getting under your skin. Anyone have a kid like that? Don't raise your hand. They're probably sitting next to you. And they're just aggravating you over and over. And then all of a sudden they want something and they act really sweet and really kind. Dad or mom, can you get me this? Is that little act of good behavior enough to turn your heart toward them and go, oh yeah, I want to spoil you. I want to bless you. Like, no, I want to punch you. Don't ask me for anything. But that's how we treat God. And sometimes we show up at church without really giving him our whole life and say, this is worship. This is good enough. And he's saying, no, I want so much more. I want so much more from you. I want so much more for you. Here's what Paul warns about the next life. And we don't, we don't think about this in Christian terms enough. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each and every one may receive what is due for what is done in the body, whether good or evil. You know who's going to be judging you? That good king who had dominion over all those areas covered in that section of regarding Jesus. That king is the one you have to face. And people think, oh, it's such a sacrifice. It's, it's so hard. Here's what David Livingston said. He's a famous missionary that spent most of his life in Africa. He said, people talk of sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called sacrifice, which is simply paid back as a small part of the great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings its own reward of healthy activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and the bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? He said, away with such a word, such a view, such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it's a privilege. So when we offer our bodies as a sacrifice, that holy and acceptable, that's terminology from the Old Testament about, uh, you know, acceptable sacrifice, animal sacrifice given in the uh, ritual acts of uh, sac uh, the sacrificial system. That was their act of worship. Our spiritual act of worship is giving Jesus our lives. This morning at Bridge Bible Church, have you given Jesus that much of your life? Because here's what we tend to do. We tend to say, you know what, God, you can have this, you can have that, I'm going to hang on to this. Francis Chan, at a retreat I was at, he, he used a Twinkie as an analogy. He started eating a Twinkie, talking about different parts of life, and what was left over was the wrapper. He said, how many of you would give this to God and say, oh, here's a wrapper, left some cake on there, a little bit of cream, happy birthday. Sometimes that's the mentality. We, we, we offer God and we forget that he's this good king. And, and sometimes, it, it's so innocent. It's just because sometimes we become so busy and we forget what's important. Third thing I think Paul is saying to us is true worshipers do not conform to the culture. Do not conform to the culture. They, he says, do not be conformed to this world. See, this is a challenge for us because let's be honest, we learn how to conform at, at a young age. You may have heard these statements, everything I needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten. Or uh, you, you learn how to sit up straight, walk straight. You know, if you're a teacher, maybe you have kids that have to walk in a straight line to the restroom. They have to be quiet or they lose their recess. I lost my recess a lot, didn't like it. But we, but we learn to conform and we learn to change. We learn to adapt. Um, I have this picture. I remember being in junior high. These jackets were all the rage. These were these starter jackets. Now listen, I did want to find a Pittsburgh one and a Browns one for today. I just couldn't. They, they don't exist on the internet. But these starter jackets, when I was in junior high, you felt like out of the loop if you didn't have one. So, so what you did was you either saved up your money or hoped Christmas came around and someone gave you that jacket because you wanted to fit in. You wanted to conform. Now, with that in mind, you might say, well, I, I don't conform. I don't change. Uh, how many of you have a smartphone here this morning? You all do. Tom, raise your hand. You're, you're reading it right now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> And how many of you said at one point in your life, I don't need it. Who needs a smartphone? I'm never going to have a smartphone. I'm never going to have a camera phone. I, I thought those were, it's like pixelated pictures. I just carry a camera. No, my, my, my smartphone is my favorite camera ever. It gets these great pictures. So, so over time, 
We tend to adapt to things. And, and see, Paul's not talking about adapting to the changing technology in the world. He, he's talking about, um, he's talking about what's going, adapting to the, the values of the culture, the direction of the culture, you know, the attitudes, the mindsets, the, 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 the ways that we displease God. So when we get to that word conformed, uh, it's, it's schizmizo. It's to form or mold one's behavior in accordance with a particular pattern or set of standards. Or another way to think of it is shaping one's behavior or conforming one's life. We think all the time, well, you know, we don't conform. We, we, we do what we want to do. But then you look around and you're like, well, I do a lot of things that are exactly like all the people right around me. Now, where we have to be careful and adapting to whether it's new methods or, or new technologies is asking the question, are we adapting to things that cause us to adapt to attitudes and morals that go against the Word of God? So when Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, he's not necessarily saying, hey, you know, don't dress appropriately when you walk in stores. In fact, in some ways, if you came from another culture and you showed up and how it would be acceptable to dress, you may not get service here and possibly you might get arrested. So there's some things you have to conform on, but we're talking about morals and values and attitudes towards God. And as we look at the world and we look at even our country, if you think back, I, I, I talk to people about this all the time, like, like 30 years ago, uh, I remember Wednesday night was like a sacred night, Wednesday and Sunday. Those were the church days in our town. Practices and games ended by four on Wednesday. You had time to do your homework, go to youth group and get to bed on time. Sundays, never a game, never a practice. You can have youth group and youth events Sunday and Wednesday and just count on it. Now there's no day that's sacred. Now there's no day that's set apart for, to, to be with other believers and, and, and you know, with, with the church and worshiping. So, you know, some of us have adapted and gotten creative and some of us, uh, you know, if you went my father-in-law's route, you just said, okay, nothing happening on Sunday. We're, we go to church, we do family things and that's it. And all their family got together for a big meal after church. So we want to understand that we're not talking about best practices or technology. We're talking about behavior. We're talking about things we accept in the moral landscape. We're talking about how we look at life. And the word world is literally this word that means age. And it's talking about the system of practices or standards associated with a secular society, a society that is without God, that is without reference to any demands or requirements of God. How many of you know Christians that think that way? They think there's no requirements for them. They say things like, I don't need a church, I'm a Christian. It's like church fuels all the spiritual disciplines. Church is where the body gathers. Church is where we're meant to grow in our faith under authority. So Paul says, do not conform. And think about all the churches that have conformed. Think about the way they've bent to issues of sexuality. Think about the way they've bent to, to, to modern issues in society and, and the way they've impacted or had not impacted society in the way that they should have. The quote that will be in your notes is, those who render spiritual worship to God resist all such pressures to conform. That is what we're called to do. We are called to stand apart. The word church means ecclesia, the called out ones, means we should stand out from the culture, not just because we gather on Sunday, but how we live our life, how we love our families. You know, if you're a wife, how you respect your husband. Husband, how you lovingly lead your wife. If you're a kid, how you submit to mom and dad. If you're a friend, how you act in that friendship. You're called to be different than what we see in society. And sometimes that's missing in the church, especially in the United States. Now think about one of our values as a church. Let me take us back a, a few months. We talked about this va value, integrity. And we said integrity is living kingdom down, not culture up. If we're living kingdom down, there, there's a subtle implication there that a kingdom has a king. For us, that king is Jesus. And that means we submit to him and not conform to the culture. Finally, point number four that Paul makes, true worshipers are completely transformed. They are completely transformed. He says, you know, by the mercies of God, I appeal to you, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Verse two, do not conform to the patterns of the world. And then we get to the number four, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The word transformed is amazing. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It means to change the essential form or nature of something, to become something completely new, to be changed into it, to change an outward appearance. And that's where we get that word metamorphosis. Transform people have a renewed mind, a mind that is renewed and that is done through the Spirit and the tool that he uses is the Scripture. It's the Word of God. Now think about the, the, the cadence that's here. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern, you may understand, be able to judge what God's good and acceptable and perfect will is for you. Before you came to Christ, before you submitted to him, before you've allowed the scripture to change your way of thinking, you don't have enough understanding to know what is good and what pleases God or even what's good for you. Many of you know this, I had ideas before I submitted my life to Christ, what I would do as a grown-up, and I, I truly believe that they would either led me to sin, led me to ruin, or just let me leave a life that completely displeased God because I didn't have the spiritual understanding to have a renewed mind and to understand what is God's will for me? What is it that he finds good? What is it that he finds perfect or sufficient and pleasing? But all that happens when we submit our minds to the Lord. We allow him to renew our mind. He wants our soul, he wants our body, he wants our mind, and he wants our service. That is what God wants from us. And a person who lives that way pleases him, lives out his will, and finds out the things that they do with their life is good, acceptable, and perfect. So the question I want to leave you with this morning is first and foremost, if you have never followed Jesus, Romans 10 makes it clear, verses 9 and 10, that you have to confess with your heart and believe with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you'll be saved. And if you're truly saved, you'll be different from there on out. Uh, next thing we got to do, we got to ask is if you call yourself a believer, have you given Jesus your whole self? Do you think about your thought life? Do you wonder, hey, are the things I'm thinking in line with what God would want me to think? The things that I do, the way I prioritize. Have you experienced a transformation that comes from the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God? We have opportunities for you to do that there outside of Sunday morning. We have ladies' Bible study. We have Thursday night men's group. We have life groups. Those are places that we're hoping that as you're together, growing in relationship, that the Word of God is bringing transformation. And the last question, and this is only you can know the answer to this. I want to say that out front. If you're, you're hearing these questions, we're not like taking a tally on each one. You're going, oh, well, that guy, he's not paying attention. Or, you know, that guy, he's not pleasing God. I've seen their social media. We don't, we don't do that. These are questions for you to ask yourself internally. The last question is, do you live a life that pleases God? Have you given your life on the altar of sacrifice and said, God gets my body, God gets my mind, God gets my future? Imagine what those people are like when they live like that. God gets it all. And here's the thing that's great. You work hard like it depends on you, but believe like it depends on God. And whether it goes good or bad, you trust him for the outcome. It's a great way to live. We can have our plans. Even Paul says, you know, if God wills it, I'm going to go here. If God allows it, I'm going to go there. It's safer to plan that way, recognizing that he may redirect our lives to places we never would have gone ourselves. And that is a great way to live. Listen, as always, if you have questions, how do I submit my life to Jesus? Please talk to me, one of the elders, one of our Bible study teachers. We love you and we want you to, to find fullness in Christ rather than live in these, th this life that's just mixed. Because here's what happens. When you mix things that shouldn't be mixed, it tastes bad. And when you drink and eat things that taste bad, it make you sick. Some people that call themselves Christians are living a life that makes them sick because they haven't figured out that it's all about Jesus. Not just our singing, not just our preaching, but our eating, drinking at home, our coming, our going, our submitting as children, our parenting, all of that is about Jesus. Our job is about Jesus. It doesn't mean that you go and wave the Jesus flag and get fired because you're not getting your work done. That's, that's not loving and submitting to Jesus, but it means being the best employee you could be to the glory of God, to live your life in such a way that God gets the glory for all the good and that we know that God can deliver us from all that is bad. We trust him to the end. 
church. Amen. Let's have a great week. We just uh, pray that you'd go out in that knowledge, knowing who our King is and how much he loves you. Uh, Have a great week, everyone. Be blessed.